Oh, excellent. Welcome, everyone. My name is Allison Daly. I am the founder and CEO of Recruiting Innovation and director of the Ernestine McClendon Talent Grant. Um, we are here as part of the Ernestine McClendon Talent Grant. Uh, this grant was named after Ernestine McClendon, the first uh, Black agent for talent and the first talent for Black agent, uh, uh, first agent for Black talent. And she single handedly got uh, Black actors onto commercials in um, America in the late 50s, early 60s. And as part of this program, we want to uh, honor and continue her legacy to create opportunity for folks from all types of backgrounds. And in our case, to enter and flourish in the tech industry um, via tech recruiter uh, certification and training. And so the Ernestine McClendon Talent Grant is a five month program uh, designed for folks from all different uh, talent experiences to come get trained, build community, get mentorship, and then leave the cohort with a certification in tech recruiting and start their careers in tech. And so part of our series, um, every month we get to hear from a leader in the space. Um, from We hear from talent, we hear from recruiting, we from, hear from sales and leadership. And today um, we get to hear from Torin Ellis, who is a man who cannot be contained in any one of those uh, verticals. Um, he is an entrepreneur, a speaker, a podcast host, a training facilitator, and just a really leading voice um, in our community, in the talent space, in the DEIB space, and always has really powerful, important things to say. And I couldn't be more honored that, to have you on our, our uh, program, Torin. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. I appreciate it. And you know what? We're going to take as much time as you need. So I'm giving it all to you. Let's hit it hard, hard and heavy. Let's go. Let's go. So, um, you know, for uh, let's hear first from your background. Like, I really love opening up and hearing about people's story because, like many uh, industries, but especially recruiting, the origin story of how we got here is just as compelling as what we're doing now. Um, so, how did you end up here uh, from the beginning ish? Yeah. So, we'll do the beginning ish in 1998. In 1998, I left MCI Communications, and for those of you who are familiar with the um, phone world, there was AT&T, there was Sprint, and there was MCI. MCI was the friends and family folks, and, and I was leading one of the top 70 teams out of 700 teams in the country. So my sales team was extremely efficient. We were extremely effective. We were tenured. Like, I had built an incredible organization and machine. Um, and it wasn't just me, it was all of us because all of us go into building a high performing team. Yes, I led the team, I'm the supervisor of the team, but if that piece is out of place, it impacts other pieces that are there. So we built an incredible, incredible organization. What I had was a manager who said, I can't trust a black man with hair on his face. So I left corporate America in August of 1998. It wasn't that only, but it was a series of different events that led to me saying, I'm done with this. I'm going to do my own thing. I started a recruiting company, borrowed $3,000 from my best friend in Philadelphia, who's still my best friend today. That means I gave him back his money plus some. Bought me a Dell computer, an $18 table from Ikea, a trash can, a $3 clock to go on the wall, and got a phone book. Nice. And what I would do started. is I would run through that phone book in the mornings and I would hit uh, organizations because nobody would be there. No receptionist, no gatekeeper, no one. I just leave a whole bunch of messages out for my candidates. And then by 12, one o'clock in the afternoon, the phone would start ringing. And that's how I started my recruiting business. Um, I think in the first year we did like $360,000. Second year we did 1.2 million. And then the bubble burst. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the bubble of 2001, that was catastrophe for so many people. But I'm a hard-headed type person. And so rather than running back to corporate America, and I don't say that negatively, but for me, rather than running back to corporate America, because I didn't really like how corporate America treated me, I said, I'm just going to drink the pill that I'm drinking or the sauce that I'm drinking now, I'm going to rebuild my business. And that's exactly what I did. And so, you know, we kept pushing and building. And this time, instead of being only in telecommunications, we got into financial services. I got into recruiting for hospitality. We got into some tech recruiting. So we were a bit more diverse when 2008 came through. 
Now, if you know 2008, that economic collapse was even harder than the bubble. But because I had been through the bubble, I was able to navigate that a little bit differently. And so it didn't impact me the way that it impacted so many other recruiters across the country. I say all of that to say, in 2011, I just said to myself, this transactional thing is not for me. I'm successful, great team, but I wanna be more of a business partner. I want people to really trust me, not just take a placement from me, trust me. And so what am I going to do to be that person that they trust, that, that, that person that they will text or they will call uh, when they don't necessarily need something, but they just want a sounding board. And I said, I'll start a diversity and inclusion consultancy. And that's where we are right now. And have you fully moved into the consultancy and tapered away the recruitment? Or is that also still going on for you? Yeah, good, great question. So uh, I show up, I guess maybe now is a good time for me to just do my little elevator pitch. That's it. Warren Ellis diversity strategist, risk mitigator. I coach, I consult, I speak all across the world around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And every once in a while, Allison, I recruit. So when I'm embedded in a client and we are helping them optimize their DNI strategy, every once in a while, they'll come to me and they'll say, Torm, we, we really need some help because our pipeline is not um, deep with representation or we've only you know all of the resumes we've received here have been monochromatic if you will homogenous mm -hmm. so we need you to kind of spice things up and we know you can do it and so we do so like right now i'm working on three searches uh for three different clients if you will all c-suite opportunities mm, awesome and when and then that's not even all that you do because then you also have your podcast um, can you talk to us? What, so what does that work look like? The consultancy, obviously you're helping clients, but you're also sharing a message and you have themes and you're, you know, sharing with the community. Can you talk to us about your outlet for like thought leadership and, and how you get what you're working on out into the world to help others, uh, learn from you as well? Absolutely. So, um, Allison mentioned the podcast, um, at one point, I was both on Sirius XM, uh, being heard by, you know, one to two million people That's every all. Sunday. <laughs> um, and my podcast with my podcast partner, Julie Sowash, uh, we do Crazy and the King. And we struggled with the name in the beginning because I, I didn't want people to be offended. But the, the, here's the sensitivity to how I do this work. So when the title or when the, 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 the name of the show was created, I said, you know, that could be a bit problematic. But my podcast partner has a hidden disability. And so that's the reason why she wanted it to be named Crazy, because she wanted people to see her as a highly functioning individual. She didn't want them to categorize her because of her disability. She didn't want them to coddle her because of her disability. She wanted people to know front and center I have a hidden disability and let's get to it. So mm -hmm. our podcast is Crazy and the King. And we talk about diversity and inclusion related subject matter every single week. New episode drops every Thursday morning. And where do they, where can people find that? Any podcast platform, like we're okay. on Spotify, iTunes, mm -hmm. wherever they uh, download podcasts, I'm sure they will be able to find Crazy and the King. And then to the other two points, coaching. I just work with executives that want to be better about modeling diversity and inclusion. Uh, so I have some coaches that I'm on a retained basis with. I have other coaches that kind of reach out when they kind of need me, if you will. I'm sorry, executives that reach out when they need me, if you will. Uh, and then I speak probably 30 to 40 times a year at a conference somewhere uh, in the country. So next week, I'll be in California at DeemCon. Uh, doing a keynote presentation on Wednesday. So looking forward to that because it's going to be my first, not my first time on stage since COVID. I've been on stage, but I haven't done a keynote. I've had to do fireside chats and all of that. I get to be by myself and in my element on Wednesday. And um, it's going to be, you know, a movie from start to finish. Oh, man. Yeah, I've seen you uh, share and it's really moving and I also think as someone who is working on um, public speaking, I still am kind of 
holding to my notes. Whereas you, it's like, you're embodying your words and it's not even like something that you formulated. It's just like stream of consciousness. Cause there's so much coming from you and, um, you're an inspiring speaker. I just want to say that, uh, <laughs> very much. So speaking of, you know, events and coming back to it, like last few years have been really intense for everyone. I think that everyone in like a micro level has been going through some form of death and rebirth. Right. And like, this, we're such a yin culture. I'm, tra I'm transitioning a little bit. We're such a yang culture that we like to have achievement and movement. And then we've had to be forced to like slow down and like not be over activated and, you know, uh, errands and things. And I see it, it's a lot of change in me, um, even from two years ago. And, you know, I'm curious for you, how have you felt yourself change? What do you see that's different for you in terms of how you move through the world or operate with your clients um, compared to two years ago before COVID? Yeah, I mean, so much has changed. You know, I, I think all of us can talk about uh, how we found, um, you know, promise inside of the pause, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, there, there definitely have been those moments where, you know, I've been able to sit back and reflect in ways that I had not reflected. Uh, in the past, because I'm always moving at 100 miles an hour. Um, I have, you know, if you look at me on, I think it's e, the moniker on my IG page, it may be on my Twitter page, but I said, I'm chasing greatness, you can have success. Like, I don't care about being successful. I want to be great. I want to be, and not great because I want to be in light. I want to be great because I want people to say, that guy right there fought hard for all of us to have access to opportunity. That dude right there fought hard to make sure that we rooted out inequity in all of our systems. And so what I've thought about over the last two years, Allison, is how can I fight smarter? Mm. How can I love deeper? How can I be more present um, in the, the opportunities in which I'm presented? How can I be more of what I say I want to be? If you want to be great, how can you be more of that? And you won't get that by simply reading a couple of books. You won't get that by uh, writing cute blog posts, if you will. You've got to do some work. You got to sacrifice some things. You got to lose some things. So I've thought hard over the last two years of, you know, how do we get to this greatness? that we want. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, how is it that I can encourage more of my clients to say, um, we need to deconstruct our entire benefit package and we need to reconstruct it in a way that leans towards the inequity that women have faced over the last 50, 70, 100 years. How, how can we do something different there? We need to root out people in HR that are protecting the organization more than they're protecting the people. Because if HR was protecting the people, then we would have never experienced Me Too the way that we experienced Me Too. And when we think about diversity and inclusion, Allison, oftentimes white men seem to be the center of the conversation, whether they are the ones who are holding the power or whether they are the culprit in the uh, situation, whatever, the white men tend to be the center of the conversation. But I look at HR and I say, well, in HR, it's a whole lot of women. And if we have Me Too and women are supposed to be protecting the employee base, which includes other women, then we need to put the blame where the responsibility needs to be. And so I try to figure out, you know, over the last couple of years, Allison, how do I just shape myself so that I'm presenting a message? Uh, presenting solution, challenging people in ways that they receive it and that they don't resist it. DNI is hard. I don't need people to resist it um, because that only keeps us where we are right now. It keeps us looking at reports of media mediocre growth or um, minimal movement. That that's what we will continue to experience. I don't want to experience that. I want my children's children to see something entirely different than I had in the 90s. I don't ever want my uh, two young kings to be told by anyone that they can't be trusted merely because they have facial hair. So I want to root out all of these inequities. And that's what I'm working hard to do every single day. Mm, very much. And I mean, it's, it's also like 
what Nicole Hannah Jones said, the time for in incremental change is over. Like two years in, everything is destabilized in every level of our society. And it's like the great disruption where it's sort of like, what was in systematic setup wasn't working actually for most people. And that is in our education, that's in our healthcare, that's in our industries, it's in our professional life, it's in our, even our personal lives and things like that. And it's, how do we take this moment where really things are crumbling and we have to take accountability as talent professionals? Like I, this, is, this is also a theme I've been thinking on, the responsibility per, as a recruiter. A recruiter, I am professional builders of, of teams. We as recruiters are professional builders of teams. We need to pull the wool off of our eyes and recognize that we have a responsibility to be the drivers of equity and inclusion and who gets in the pipelines and who gets the extra encouragement or the extra coaching and walk through and, you know, set up for success. And the, it's a whole life cycle. Like we cannot fix a slice and think it's going to work. We need to actively look at our full on recruiting and retention process recognize everything is working by design. There's a reason that 70 plus percent of tech are males and predominantly 27 year old and they're cis and you know, the like finds like. And so we have to rethink everything that we take as granted and saying, how do we do this different? How do we do a belief structure update? How do we update the recruiting industry for 21st century life? Um, full stop. Yeah, let's get to that. So um, I said uh, on a stage in September of 2015, and people are going to, you know, you'll know I'm not lying. You can Google it. Uh, you, you can just Google it. I'm on a stage in September of 2015, and I'm the only representative on this panel that doesn't have a big logo behind me. You know, I'm not even going to say their names. They had logos behind them. Me, it's just Torin Ellis. So I'm in a room, and I said, listen, you all are expecting something to happen that's not going to happen. We need to reset our expectations. And what I was referring to was Google in this example. I said, if you want to change the growth that Nicole Hannah-Jones incremental growth that you mentioned a moment ago, if you want to see a different number of representation inside of Google, this is what's required. They will need to fire half of their staff and then prioritize inclusion and representation as they began to rehire those individuals. At the time, Google was 60,000 employees in September of 2015. The diversity numbers of representation was 3%. In June of 2021, Google is now 120,000 employees and their representation is 4%. So they've doubled in staff, but they've grown a mere 1% in representation. And I can't remember the number exactly, but that would suggest that it's another like 340 or so, you know, diverse uh, or underestimated marginalized candidate. It's less than a thousand that they added like incrementally. It's crazy. So my point in all of this is that we need to have a different set of expectations. And as recruiters, we are the vanguard of opportunity. We mm. sit right at the door of whether or not we can usher in people to these opportunities. And we got a responsibility, as you alluded to, Allison, to make sure that we are widening the aperture for all audiences, that we are not just looking at race and gender, but that we are looking at people from different socioeconomic backgrounds that we're looking at people with different academic footprints than we might be accustomed to, that we are pulling people with different religious and political beliefs that can contribute to the organization, that we are unafraid of the tension that can come from people contributing to the conversation because they think differently. We have missed so many marks. Mm -hmm. And when you have recruiters saying that, I don't wanna lower the bar because I'm going after the diversity, or I, I, I work on or operate off of meritocracy, if you will. All of that is a facade, a facade, facade, however you like to say it. It's just a curtain of, you know, I ain't going to curse under Miss Ernestine's uh, conversation. I'm just saying it's a facade and you need to challenge that. As a recruiter, challenge that. And we will do our space more service if we challenge our hiring managers. 
Yes, we work with them, for them, but we are in a partnership. And partnerships means that we both have some say in how we do things. As recruiters, flex your power in that relationship. 100%. I think the days of you know, assuming that recruiters were the order takers and that hiring with someone was as easy as a, a turkey sandwich uh, order from the deli, right? It's like it, it, people are more nuanced than that. Organizations are more nuanced than that. And actually, when, you know, when thinking about the full eco life cycle of a candidate experience, there's just, there's a million places that we can all just do a little bit better on. And like cumulatively, it doesn't need to be something super drastic, but it needs to start with recognizing a that I have this responsibility and I actually can offer a lot of impact. And also the idea of if you're truly recruiting and building your network, you're not in it for the short term. You learn that you're gonna be consistent. You're gonna pick a couple communities, pick a couple communities that you go to every month when they have meetups virtually every other month is minimum, try to sponsor. Like how, until we learn as a group to get out of our own space and get out into the world, um, we just keep, recycling the same thoughts and uh, patterns. Um, what, what, is you, how, what have you seen that's successful for folks that genuinely want to expand their awareness, um, but you know, have a really long way to go, or they're just getting started? Let's, that's, that's, that's a nice way to say it. They're just getting started. And um, what, what, what do you tend to recommend or guide folks on or point them to resources to just start the journey of self-educating? Be careful who you let pour into you. Mm. So I'll give you two examples. Um, number one, there's a statistic out on the uh, internet and the statistic is, you know, it's it's been circulating for years. I don't know where it started. I don't even know when it started, but there's a statistic out that says recruiters look at a resume for six seconds. Have you seen that, Allison? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. Six seconds. So I, I looked at that and I smiled and I said, oh, you know, let's say 60 seconds. You know, I'm willing to give it even more time. What can you possibly glean from a person in six seconds or 60 seconds? Can you really intimately get into how they've drafted their story on the document? Now, certainly there are a number of people who just write terrible resumes. You clearly can look at it and say, not a go, not a fit. But I think we, it's problematic that we are subscribing to the st six second statistic and allowing that to inform whether or not I reach out to Allison, whether or not I reach out to Torin, or whether or not I reach out to these folks coming from these other uh, communities. So that's number one. I try not to necessarily uh, be influenced by data or information or person's um, commentary if it's kind of like, um, faulty, if you will. The other piece that I think is a real, real challenge is we try to hide behind curtains. I said for Cades a moment ago, for Cods, but I think that this whole unconscious bias phrase is problematic. And, and I think it's problematic because when I think about the other statistic of people with black sounding names uh, are not getting callbacks, same exact resume, I can put, you know, one name on this one, one name on that one, but the one with the more ethnic sounding name is not getting calls or the one that is more homogenous and cis is getting called 12 times more. Listen, that's, that's a challenge for me. But what we are doing in our space is we are couching that under unconscious bias. Oh, I didn't know I was doing it. No, you know. You know that you are discounting a person because their zip code doesn't match a zip code of influence or a zip code of, you know, high performing schools or educational facilities or a zip code with a bunch of high rise, whatever the reason. You know that you are discounting a person because they belong to a certain uh, fraternity or sorority or that they took a coding boot camp and not uh, a degree in computer science or information systems. You know that you are discounting people for these things. And what I'm suggesting is that if we are going to be the vanguard, which we are, if we're going to be honest and uh, authentic and genuine about how we do our work, listen, if a person has a modicum of information and experience worth your exploring, explore.
That's all I'm asking you to do. It goes so much further for us to just have a conversation with a person and say, listen, I was wondering, um, I don't know necessarily if you fit, but I wanted to reach out and give you a call anyway. I wanna hear your story. I wanna give you a chance to tell me why we should be considering you for the opportunity. You may not be ideal on paper, but there may be a jewel hidden inside of the way that you tell your story. You may have missed one of the I's or striking one of the T's, but there's some accomplishment that's woven deep into your story. Tell me your story. I can take five minutes to hear a person's story. And what does that do? Well, you know what, Torin? Thanks for sharing. Not really a great add to the business that we're trying to build, but, and what does Torin do? Torin, I, you know what? I really appreciate you reaching out to at least give me a chance. Let me share your opportunity with some other folks in my network. Rather than sending me a, form letter email saying, we'll keep your resume on file. As a recruiter, the reason why I won, Allison, the reason why we built a successful business is because we were willing to go the extra mile back then and still today. I am not willing to operate like every other recruiter. I don't want to discount people. I'm finding ways to include them in consideration. If in the end, we have to disposition you, that is what happens in the end. But I'm trying to bring people in so that we can move them through the process of consideration. That's what I want these recruiters to do and do better at. I love that, especially since it's sort of, you know, as you mentioned, humanity a lot, it brings the humanity back to the process when these tech tools are trying to just like take over and, um, you know, automate certain things, but really what we need to be doing is just smaller, but more consistent conversations rather than just like notes back and forth at sur surface level. And like, this kind of comes back to, you know, <clears throat> becoming aware as a recruiter, all the things that, you know, why, by the time they even get to you, they're already like eight steps behind in certain ways from other candidates. And so it's like, um, you know, I, I love, I actually like stopped my bike. I was listening to Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. Uh, I was riding my bike to work and he had this section about how as the default setting in the U.S. is racist, is racism, right? It's like we took land from indigenous people and enslaved uh, Africans to build the wealth and everything is by design to extricate, extricate every level of value up to the very top, right? And like, from how schools get funded by house prices, from you know public transportation being underfunded because we wanna keep segregation going, to education, to opportunity, and like all these things where we need to recognize that if we do everything that's normal, we are inherently being racist because it's a racist society. And so in order to be anti-racist, we actually have to do things different. And so when we're over-indexed, on an, a minority percentage of people, what we need to do is actually work harder to support folks to get to the point where they have the same opportunity. It's actually anti-racist to help people and lift them up and give them a chance that was inherently in by design for this other group of people. And so that concept of like, if you do nothing, you're playing along with the system. And so you actually should do things differently in order to get a different outcome, if you're really meaning it and you really want to produce what you say you want to produce, you know? Yeah, it's just about holding people accountable, Allison. Okay. I mean, again, it's it's taking the action that you say is important, important and being held accountable for that. You know, an example would be after uh, George Floyd and, you know, this about this will be the one and only time that I mentioned, you know, his name. Um, after George Floyd, organizations in June, July, August of 2020 committed somewhere in the neighborhood of $58 billion to racial, social justice issues or issues related to diversity and inclusion in the workplace. $58 billion. In June of last year, one year later, they looked at how much of that money had been realized. And the number that is going around is 0.5%. Oh, man. So now I'm not a math whiz. But if you pull out a calculator and you put up 58 billion, 
with the appropriate number of zeros and you multiply that by 0.5%, you come up with a very paltry number. What that suggests is that we have one, too many people not being held accountable, and two, another example of Google doubling in size over a six year period and nothing happening. And so what I say is we will know that diversity and inclusion is embedded in an organization when the reason why they are doing it has nothing to do with the name that I just said a moment ago. Right, because they see the value of meeting their customers where they're at, meeting the community where they're at. It's, it's also one of those things where it's just like, at some point, if you don't progress and become more inclusive and equitable, you're constraining your talent that you can pick from. You are constraining your market size. Like, um, I'm trying to remember who just recently said it. It was a really uh, badass woman entrepreneur, but she was basically saying, we're in the new times and you either evolve or you're now going to go the way the dinosaur because you simply can't keep up because this is the future. And there's so many benefits on so many levels. And it's, it's specifically the idea of time to right some wrongs. There's, you know, we have some accountability uh, in, in this world that we need to, you know, reconcile. And I think what you're doing, um, uh, what people are doing individually, you know, I think collectively we can start moving the, the needle, but it, it's also going to take certain industries to just take some accountability. And that's sort of where I'm being in the drum is like recruiting. This is literally on us. Like it, we haven't gotten better as a, an industry in hiring black men as in 25 years, we're still hiring black men in the same rate as the late nineties. And that's like literally on us and there's no one else we can really blame. And I know people like to shuffle it around um, and give it to the hiring managers or what have you. But like we as recruiters have a lot of power and there's a lot of ways, like you're saying, just grab a five minute phone call. Don't let the resume be the end all be all question your hiring manager. Why is a degree necessary and ex years of experience and you know, where can we chip away? Um, but then it's hard when you see something as big as Google that has that opportunity to be a leader and they continue to decline that, that opportunity. Like what's, what are some things that are giving you hope? What's been lighting you up that you're like, you know, we're getting some progress, at least in this area. I would say um, what's probably given me the most hope over the last couple of years is I've seen a, a growth in, in my clients, within my clients that are, that are checking for people's participation in d and And let me give you an example. What I encourage all of my clients to do is on the performance evaluation, add one question. And that question is pretty simple. What have you done to support our DNI efforts in the company? Ask that one question of every single person across the franchise. 500 people, 5,000 people, 50,000 people, doesn't matter to me, ask one question. Because what that suggests, Allison, is that if I'm being asked the question, then that one means it's important. Now, in 2022, I may be asked, what did I do to support the internal DNI efforts or DEIB efforts? And my response, Allison, may be nothing. I didn't do anything. I wasn't interested. I didn't know how. I was afraid. Um, could have said the wrong thing. So I just, I didn't do anything. Whatever the reason, I did nothing. If I'm smart and engaged and I wanna have a life with this organization, then it's going to suggest that next year, I don't wanna say nothing. So I got 12 months to get my butt in gear and do something. Volunteer at a local community, introduce a collaboration partner, suggest a strategic um, um, measure be taken, add some efficiency, support our corporate social responsibility efforts, provide some learning and development su uh, suggestions. I'm going to do something to help my organization with their DNI 
efforts. That's what I'm going to do. One question doesn't cost you anything, but it gets more people involved. And the reason why I want more people involved, Allison, is because the re we, we've, we've not had the growth and progress that we're looking for because it's typically been on the shoulder of one person, a chief diversity officer or the program director for diversity or the people that care about diversity, which is a small, it's always been on the backs of a few rather than the many. And so ask the one question so that we can get the many involved and move in, in the same direction. That's what's caused me so much excitement over the last couple of years because I've gotten more clients to understand, wow, doesn't cost anything. And yeah, we can say all of these things about diversity and inclusion, but until we get people at, uh, activated and modeling and participating, until that activation, that modeling and that participation takes root, then all of it is just words on a piece of paper, beautiful social posts. I need something more substantive than a beautiful social post, than words on a paper, than a check being stroked at a nonprofit dinner. I want people moving to make things better inside of the organization. And funny enough, Allison, if I can make it better in the organization, I can make it better in my community. That's right. Yeah. And then there's, I was like, I liked how you were mentioning there's all the different ways that this could show up and it doesn't have to be some formal something top down. It really is from the grassroots and you hope that at some point they'll, we'll meet right. The high strategy and, and, and things with grassroots development and, um, and that's it too. It's just sort of, I think that that's part of the moment that we're in also now is just everyone's kind of evaluating like what, what do I want my life to look like? And how do I spend my days and, and who do I trade my talent to for money or salary and all of those things. And, you know, it's, it's a ripe time for change and development or just transformation of thought processes. And I'm hopeful and also know that, gosh, it's a really big world. And uh, as long as we can also like link arms and, and, connect with each other horizontally while we're trying to build up uh, vertically as well. I think that's what's been a big theme for me is the community element of really getting to know people or getting their hands dirty and getting out there. And, and, you know, you don't have to know exactly what to say, but just say something or, you know, get movement, get moving. That's Listen, as committed as I am to DNI, I even make mistakes. And I don't say that in a way like, Oh my God. I mean, talk, yeah. I'm, we're human. So I don't allow the possibility of maybe saying something wrong or my timing be off, prevent me from participating. If I say something that's wrong, or if I do something that requires apology, I apologize, period. And we keep moving. And that brings to question, you know, that statement around, um, it's not your intent, it's your impact. Mm -hmm. And in that statement, what people are doing is they're minimizing a person's intent and they're focusing only on the impact. Well, what you said, it hurt or what you did, it hurt. And that's all that matters is that it hurt. No, that's not all that matters. I had good intentions. I may have said something that was wrong or off time. Um, you know, I may have taken an action, suggested a person for a promotion, uh, encouraged an individual for sponsorship or mentorship. I may have suggested that this team take a project over another team. What are, my intentions were good. So I don't want you to minimize my intentions or let me say it differently. I don't want you to dismiss or discount my intentions. I want you to look at me as a whole individual. So my intentions matter just as much as my impact does. So I just want people, when you hear that phrase now going forward, intent versus impact, I'd like for you to consider it my way instead of the way that we have been socialized to consider it over the last five years. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's sensitive to, it's similar to like when you're learning any sort of new skill set, or um, it's a process and it's, it's, a, it's a muscle and just, you know, the, even just the, the act of like noticing around how systems work and actually realizing you're just not 
operating under the operating system you've been given. And then as you learn and you can start talking, it's sort of like the child that's learning to walk. You're going to fall down a few times. It's going to be awkward, but like say the thing, like it's on all of us to do little things to, to say what we need to, or promote an idea or what have you. And I love what you're saying because it's like <clears throat> progress over perfection. Let's at least get it out there. And especially with the good intentions um, behind it and allowing for course correction and that learner mindset of, well, learn something there. Okay, keep going uh, as well. Yeah. Um, I wanna open it up. Anyone that's in, in with uh, the call with us, please uh, welcome any questions that you have for a Torin or anything that you would wanna follow up with him. Um, we've got about 10 more minutes. Um, what, what did you say, uh, Torin, for our audience? So we have um, the, the Ernestine McClendon Talent Grant recipients come from a wide array of uh, career paths. So we have folks that are experienced recruiters, new to tech, coming from the HR side, wanting to round out their skill set, people coming from services, retail, um, even education. So folks that are, you know, choosing this path for themselves, um, what, what kind of words of encouragement do you have? What tips for success? Um, what are like two or three nuggets that you'd want to give folks in terms of um, moving into this career and, you know, kind of basically changing their lives a little bit. Yeah, become a good storyteller. So uh, when I think about most uh, job requisitions that will be handed to you, most of them are looking backwards. In many instances, you will find employers that are just simply pulling the job description from a year ago, two years ago, because they constantly hire this particular role, if you will. So most job descriptions are historical in nature. They look backwards. And yet that's what we are publicizing to um, the general marketplace, a historical view of what we need in terms of a person. That's already fault number one for me. I say become a good storyteller because I, Allison, want to compel you to want to be interested in what it is that I have because what I'm painting for you is something that's going to provide you with more promise, with more opportunity, with more knowledge, financial gain. It's going to be something that your family's going to appreciate. So whether you are considering an opportunity across town or one with, with, which requires relocation, how do I paint a beautiful story, an aspiring story of what this role looks like? Is that aspiring story hidden or only attached to whether or not a person knows certain technologies? Probably not. But is that story attached to how a person is going to be developed in the role, how they're going to be led in this role, how they're going to be supported by their leader, how they're going to be positioned for beautiful opportunity and growth, how they can plant their root here and perhaps not be like they had to have been over the last five, 10 years where they've had to pick up and leave every 18, 24, 36 months. Can we do something different in this organization and, and provide people that are higher engaged and um, longer tenure and even more productive? All of that is in the story. So I want people to tell better stories when we are out recruiting. The other nuances, the hard skills, they'll kind of shape and take, that has a place, I get it. I'm not minimizing it, but I wanna hear the beauty of me considering this opportunity or you considering this opportunity. So that's the one piece that I would give to all of them. Be a better storyteller. I love that. Yeah, I mean, especially when, like there's so many touch points that's related to communication and our flow, whether it's getting the job description right or how we have our career site or how, what we write in our outreach messages or our follow-up emails or in interviews. And, and um, I was at, at Sherm Talent last week, uh, or was it this, it was this week, it's all such a blur. Um, and the CHRO for Guild Education here in Denver was really amazing. Um, it was my first time seeing her and her name escapes me right now, unfortunately. But she was saying, she said an illustrious career, but how much really marketing and communications needs to go through the recruiting and HR function because we need to think of how we're positioning the company or the opportunities or the team. And it's not just this job description, but to think of the whole story, what's the whole story you're telling across the touch points for those candidates? Because they are checking you out now and they are being discerning and 
they can smell the BS a mile away. So like how to really embed the, the small messages throughout the, the full process that you're, you know, validating the right opportunity. And, and I also really love to think, oh, please go ahead. No, I don't want to cut you off, Allison, but I want to just connect two dots. So I started my recruiting company in 98. I'm telling you how I recruited. So we're talking 1998. The beautiful individual that you just referenced is saying that now in 2022, and I'm not in any way judging her. I'm simply saying it's timeless and it works. Mm -hmm. If we can tell better stories 15 years from now, I don't care what technology is in the marketplace. If we can paint and tell stories that center our candidate in a way that is promising, that they can absolutely see, it's almost like real estate agents. Mm -hmm. They do that staging process. They want you to feel like this is a home that you can be in, that this is an apartment that you can be in, a condo that you could invest in. They stage it, put cookies in and have the scent and all of those things so that you feel like this is where you need to be. Well, as recruiters, we, we owe it to our people and to ourselves to be able to do the same thing. What does that require? It requires that we understand the organization, mm -hmm. that it's more than just a requisition, which is again, why I say that we are so incredibly important. Because if we know the organization and we can look forward and tell stories, we are like an unstoppable force of good for every uh, uh, company that we represent. Amazing. Yeah. And I love that analogy of, of the staging in real estate. Cause I, you know, we also, in one of our training classes, um, the tech recruiter certification, I talk about in the outreach message that we uh, class, we need to really cultivate a pull energy instead of this push energy. And like, we get all so busy and we're just doing everything like, you know, what, whatever you do when you're really busy, you're just shoving stuff out. Right. And when we slow down and we orient them, we may make them the hero of the story and we're able to give the context. And like you said, got the smells and the cookies, come on in. Like that's, you slow down to speed up, right? And like, if we can put in the time to really cultivate uh, the right messaging and that candidate first orientation, the rest of it's gonna be so much faster and smoother. Um, it's like, you gotta just put it up in the time in up front and you'll get it on the tail end um, for sure on the way back. So it looks like you have a quiet group because I don't I guess see any so. questions yeah. in the chat. You I, I, got a quiet group. Um, I hope that, so so you, just to see some activity over in the chat, if what I'm saying is resonating, like put a thumbs up. Now, I don't know if you're out there. So if you don't put a thumbs up, then Allison will know that it's not resonate. But if it's resonating, like put a thumbs up or something, just put something in the chat like, you know, what we are saying, what we are discussing is landing with each and every one of you. And I'd love to answer questions if you have them. Yeah, this is a, a rare opportunity. Well, I, Torin makes himself very available, but you have a chance now to, to really get to speak with him. And all right, Takoya's here. Yay, welcome. Camille also, yay. Okay, so people are livening up. They said, well, we can do this, yes. Um, how about, okay, one last question. Um, maybe Maybe two more questions. One, one around resources and developing ourselves. So what, what should we be listening to, attending, reading? Like where can we get some, you know, fresh, hot off the press thoughts on recruiting, talent, DEIB, that sort of thing. Um, where can we be up leveling our, our knowledge? Um, so one, make sure you're listening to Crazy and the King. I was going to, okay. Because uh, Julie and I, we make sure we provide resources, events, and you know, different things that are happening that may miss your radar every single week. So that's what I would do. The other thing that I would do is rather than point you to a number of people like Aubrey Blanche and Rachel Williams and um, Nicole Sanchez and Daisy Auger Dominguez, you know, I could rattle off a bunch of names of people that are doing incredible work in the DNI space. I'm just going to challenge you get out on the social platforms like Twitter, like LinkedIn and just type in diversity and inclusion and see what comes back. Get out on the various um, podcasting platforms, type in equality and equity and representation, see what comes back because everything won't land with you. Like you might listen to Crazy and the King and say, now nah, they curse too much. 
I don't want to be, I don't want to listen to them or they, whatever, that's fine. I'm not offended by that. I want things that land with you to be what you embrace. So go out and search, take it in for 60 days, 90 days, and then readjust. If you like it, great, keep it. If you don't, move it out of the way. I'm doing it right now. Two years ago, I went 90 days of studying hijabi women. So I followed hijabi women on Twitter. I listened to podcasts that they did because I wanted to, um, I guess I wanted to be more aware and more familiar with that culture and how they moved and how they thought and all of those things. Now, starting May 1st for 90 days, I'm going to do the same thing in the disability community because it came about on a two episodes ago, uh, I think it was two. I said, you know, Julie, I don't know any influencers in the disability community. Well, I knew Judy Human. Judy Human is who they made a uh, Crip Camp about, which is on Netflix. Okay, I know Judy. I've interviewed Judy, talked to Judy, we communicate. But outside of Judy, I didn't know anyone. So I said, for 90 days, I'm getting ready to speed up a little bit on my learning. And it's a beautiful intimacy for me of learning about their community, their culture, how to do things, how they say things, what's important to them. So the advice that I would have is just insert yourself in a curious way. If it's podcasts that you like, go out and find some podcasts. If you love reading, go out and read. Just find books that I have tons of books behind me and on the side of me and all of that stuff. So I could always suggest them. Color of Law is an incredible book to read by Richard Rothstein. The Color of Law is an incredible, incredible book. Isabel Wilkinson's Cast is an incredible book to read. But you may not like those two books. You may not like Ibrahim Kindi's book that you mentioned, Allison. So I just want you to find material that's different than your normal diet and consumption and that will challenge you to grow in a way that stretches you so that you are more human. Mm, that's it. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful is we just as much as we got here based on some things, we get to choose where we're going and we get to choose how we're going to grow and what we, you said, careful what you put, you know, who pours into you and what you pour out. And we actually have a lot of control and a lot of power to change and become the people we want and lead organizations in the way we, we want. So this has been super powerful. Thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you? Across all of the digital platforms at Torin Ellis, T-O-R-I-N-E-L-L-I-S. I'm on awesome. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and every once in a while I get on Facebook. Um, but the other three I'm pretty consistent on, at Torin Ellis. Okay. And then any other speaking things coming up besides the, the Bean Conference? Um, as of yet probably Allison I just don't have it memorized I that's know it Con, Bean Con is the one that's on my calendar for next week okay well one thing at a time right <laughs> well we do a million things on the side as well well thank you for your time thank you for everyone that joined us on the call um, absolute pleasure um, once again I'm Allison Daly with Recruiting Innovation and this was part of the Ernestine McGlendon Talent Grant um, leadership series. If you're interested in learning more about how to either contribute as a mentor to the talent grant, become a recipient, or even nominate someone, please go to recruitinginnovation.com forward slash grant and find out how you can get particip uh, participate with us and help us grow the future of tech recruiting industry. Uh, thank you, everybody, and bye for now.